So just for, for Vermonters that aren't familiar with the situation, um, just why are you here today? Why you want to kind of bring light to the situation and, and what you think they should know about? Mm -hmm. So it's a few things. Um, there's a National Day of Action um, that's been called for and going on in solidarity with the defense of the Walani Forest in Atlanta. Um, this is where there's a proposed uh, almost $100 million police training facility that would be built on the site of a 90-acre forest. Um, and there's been sort of ongoing protests, popular unrest, uh, you know, and a battle uh, both in the forest and kind of in the city council and in the press uh, about that mm -hmm. for a number of years now. Um, but it's really recently hit a peak uh, since one of the protesters was murdered by the police there, um, uh, Tortuguita, uh, it's, as I believe the pronunciation, though I don't speak Spanish, um, so I, I apologize if I get that wrong constantly. Um, and uh, so I think the, the rally itself is just in solidarity with that day. Um, and then specifically, uh, there are a number of corporations who are really directly involved with the Atlanta Police Foundation who are funding this project. Um, and one of those corporations, one of the prominent corporations involved in that is Cox Enterprises, which is my family's corporation. Um, they have some active businesses in Vermont, um, in Burlington, and basically in any state. Um, <clears throat> so I came to speak a little bit to my family's role in that, uh, their role in the media, because they also sort of dominate the local media in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, and then somewhat ironically, my sort of career in anti-police organizing in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that I, I actually have a lot of familiarity with like the people who are involved in some of the organizations defending the forest. Um, you know, and, and I was even, you know, directly involved with a couple of the organizations when I was down there. So uh, I came personally to speak about that. I know uh, there are some other groups that uh, had words about kind of overlapping issues uh, come today. I, you know, I, I've come from kind of New Hampshire and Massachusetts, uh, so I, I'm not as familiar with the local folks who are speaking, but um, I understand the, the broader issue and kind of what my role in coming with. I know you're kind of speaking about your, your family's funding uh, around the, the project, but mm -hmm. how would the project specifically affect people in the area with the, in that forest forestry area? Well, I mean, to begin with, uh, Atlanta is kind of known as a very green city, a city of trees, um, and this specific forest in the southwest is known as one of the four lungs of the city. Mm -hmm. um, what we're also seeing at the same time is a, a mass displacement, uh, overwhelmingly, of the black community in Atlanta, um, which was historically a black majority city and is no longer a black majority city. Um, uh, for instance, MLK's neighborhood, you know, uh, the old Fourth Ward, uh, is basically a place with like multi-use developments, um, you know, loft apartments and smoothie shops, and like a lot of police uh, with like robots and cameras, um, and. This is just an expansion of that. While they continue to under-resource all of the communities, uh, especially the poor communities and the black communities in Atlanta, you know, there are rich white suburbs that are trying to secede and become their own cities mm -hmm. at the same time. So it, it's all a, a, a systemic issue of you know how capitalist society is developing at this point, um, and these expressions of police violence are you know are a, a natural development of that. Mm -hmm. And is this kind of a, a battle between resources for the community versus resources for police? Like, how do you kind of view this? Old yeah, resources for the people versus resources for the police um, who serve those who are against the people. Um, and, and resources, uh, even, even outside of the question of uh, financial resources, um, just the devastation of such a large, I mean, 90 acres of forest in a major city. Um, I actually, you know, I worked next to that forest too, um, it, it, and you really do. You're coming out of downtown Atlanta, and suddenly you're in like a totally undeveloped forest, uh, and it's a beautiful thing about what's there. And that you know they would be setting bombs off, uh, you know, and having kind of like militarized riot squads uh, touring around there who are immediately going to criminalize, you know, and dominate and brutalize the communities right there in South Atlanta to make way for the next wave of investment and settlement. You know. Yeah, I think we get it. Well, thank you so much for your, for your time. Appreciate it. Is there anything before we let you go that you still wanted to say? I mean, that you haven't? Well, well I just think uh, 
a, you know, a couple things about you know the, the, that I did want to highlight is that I do think the media in Atlanta has been really complicit in uh, demonizing the people involved in defending the forest, calling them outsiders when I know they're not. Um, and this definitely has to do with the investments that my family's company has in that and that the folks that they sit on boards with in other companies have to do with that, I'm sure companies that own your station. Uh, and then one thing I didn't mention is that uh, this unprecedented sort of leveling of domestic terrorism charges uh, at now at 23 more sort of young people who were at a music festival you know, against Cop City. Uh, they've been given domestic terrorism charges with carry like hundreds of thousands of dollars of bail, um, you know, and like incredibly serious consequences. Um, so that should be a trend that really disturbs people interested in any kind of civil liberty. Um, and, and it's uh, put a real uh, need out there for people to donate to the bail fund, which is at um, the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, if you look it up. Um, I, I can't remember the link off the top of my head. Uh, but it, for those interested, I think it's important to donate to the Atlanta Solidarity Fund. Thank you so much, Ferry. Appreciate you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle McCormick from Cooperation Vermont, and I just wanted to welcome everybody for a moment. It is just four o'clock now, and um, so our plan is, in general, right, <laughs> roughly speaking, is that we'll just hang out here for a little bit and let folks gather and um, Definitely be talking to the folks around you. Look for people that you don't know. Say hi. Find out what they're working on. Network. Build community. Right? This is a great time and space to do that. Because I think we're all coming from different vantage points and different organizations and efforts that we're all working on. And I think the name of this game is collaboration, connection, coordination. So we're going to do that for a bit. And then I think we're going to go on walkabout. And we're going to take this party to dealer.com, not in a problematic way. My eight-year-old is here. Say hi, Jai. He's not gonna say hi. So not in a problematic way, but in a real way. And we're gonna go say hi to those folks. Does anybody know why we're gonna go say hi to those folks? Yeah. Well, in case you don't know, right? Fergie, do you wanna tell them why we're going? Or do you want me to tell them? Well, you got a mic. I got a mic. Uh, <laughs> mic because Dealer.com is a division of Cox Enterprises, which is my family's privately held company, which is one of the prime investors in Cop City, and the company which dominates the Atlanta media. Um, uh, so I, I think it's worth making a statement there. Um, well, or the folks who organize this, they just asked me to come talk. But, uh, but I think it's, it's a place worth having that discussion. Um, and it, it's impacting you know, it impacts the local economy and a lot of businesses, a lot of companies that are directly involved in this and any cop murder project anywhere uh, uh, are, you know, well funded by whatever. All the Atlanta companies, Home Depot, Coke, uh, and then Norfolk Southern is like really deeply involved in this, which is the same company involved in East Palestine, Ohio, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah. All right. Thank Those you. That. So I'm going to put the music on for a wee bit. I don't know if we should move over to a place where we're not standing in parking. Yeah, right. In case people need to park. Um, maybe over on the other side towards the actual park. Yeah. But are you in a nice way? No, it's not. Yeah, I'm sorry. 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 Stop! 
Stop Cop City. 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 Hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to join us today. My name is Michelle Edelman McCormick. I am a coordinator and organizer with Cooperation Vermont. And part of the crew that called this rally today to act in solidarity with this national call for action to stop Cop City. Community Movement Builders in Atlanta is part of the People's Network for Land and Liberation, of which Cooperation Vermont is also a part of. So it's particularly important to know that their partners in Vermont shout out. And we did. And I said, construction and expansion. For those that do not know us, Free Her is a collective of prison abolitionists and community members mobilizing against the state's efforts to build four new prisons at a cost of 250 million, beginning with a down payment of 15.5 million to start with the women's prison construction first. Even though we know there are only gonna be around 10 people that have sentences longer than five years in CRCF, they're going to build a new women's prison that can hold 194 people. We're here because our struggles are extremely connected. Hello? Okay, so we're here because our struggles are extremely connected 
And we can see this firsthand with the fact that we are also facing carceral construction with these new prisons. What we're witnessing with Cobb City and these new constructions is the counter-revolution and opposition in action. These types of carceral projects are popping up around the country following the 2020 uprisings, many utilizing COVID relief funds to bankroll their plans to further deplete our communities. Our liberation is intertwined and Stop Cop City illustrates the collective nature of this fight because the Atlanta grounds will serve as a training space for police departments across the country to learn to exterminate and control social movements and uprisings. Our government only plans to answer our calls for freedom with more violence and containment, and that must influence how we move forward. As more and more people become displaced and have less access to social services, the more we will see our community members end up in prisons. They have no public safety plans that involve nourishing communities by investing in them. They only plan to control us. We cannot wait until the state has built up all their tools of domination. It's time to rise up and push back against Cobb City with everything we've got because the construction will be detrimental for our communities, the environment, and our progress towards an abolitionist future. We have tangible and real solutions for the state to follow. We hope to create a model for the rest of the country to use in response to their own efforts to move toward abolition and eliminate the need for state institutions like prisons and cop cities. Yeah. But, but we need the support of neighbors like you to get stakeholders to understand that the time for abolition is now. Please join us in our collective to build up people power. We currently need a massive amount of support around pushing our priority legislation, H445 and H438. H445 is a prison moratorium bill which halts prison construction for five years, but not necessary repairs or maintenance, and also lifts the ban on school construction we have in this state. And just so folks know, state aid for school construction has been suspended for 16 years. What does that say about Vermont's priority? Our vision is that the state invests in solutions like the ones laid out in H438, the Alternatives to Incarceration Bill, introduced by Representative Brian Chena. We love Brian. H438 establishes a working group of directly impacted community members to research and develop a diverse continuum of housing wrapped in varying levels of community-based supports and services. We're hoping the creation of this continuum of housing will lead to the eventual end of use of prisons by 2030. For those that are interested, please use our toolkit um, at the, the hyphen council.us backslash call VT legislator, but I will have QR codes, so come up to me if you need them. And um, also we will be having a rally at the State House on April 15th from one to three to build momentum around the bills and our ideas for an abolitionist future, so please consider joining us in mobilizing your own networks. The vision for abolition is to build up vibrant, whole, and strong communities. We want to see facilities in our neighborhoods with wraparound services so our people can heal with us, and so that funding that is meant for harm reduction, therapy, mental health, and other supports are in our hands and not in the hands of the state or DOC. People are suffering, and we need to start getting creative with our solutions. Let's pause and look out the way we do things because more carceral infrastructure is a step backwards and we must demand better for our communities. Thank you so much, Jaina, for that. And, um, you know, while Jaina was speaking, I just like this, this imagery for me, that I could not get out of my head, right, is thinking about the fact that we have a high school and a Macy's in this town, but we have a moratorium on school construction in the state of Vermont, while these clowns, and I emphasize clowns, have the unmitigated audacity to already be spending money on planning for these prisons here in Vermont. And you can't tell me that this isn't a calculated strategy, right? That this is a calculated strategy on what they're planning to do as their housing and jobs program for our future, right? Because put your money where your mouth is, and that's where they're putting their money. 
So this is what they're planning on to address the ongoing and worsening housing crisis in this state. The fact that schools are clearly having some serious issues. So I just want you to think about that. And I'm going to just stop talking because I could go on. What I want to do is introduce Fareed and also take this moment to thank Fareed and the People's Kitchen so very much for preparing a meal for us back at Callahan Park when we're done with this party in front of dealer.com. I'll be really quick. Uh, most of the criminals that we call criminals, they're actually people struggling with their economic situation. We all need three things. We need food, we need housing, and we need care when we need it. Yeah. That's it, like everybody needs that. And the real criminals are people who create the economic conditions so that people are not able to meet these needs. It's, it's the taxes of the world and people who benefit from prison and from the social control that prison enables. So food for everybody, we have more than enough. We have more than enough to house everybody and we need free health care for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fareed, for that and for that food that I can already smell cooking off of him. It's going to be so good. Okay, and the next uh, person that I'm going to introduce is Chris. He's really tall. Okay, so yeah, I was like, I can't miss him. <laughs> All right, so Chris from Sanding Trees, right? Yeah. And, um, and, and here is another opportunity to make some additional linkages. In, this, linkages. in the same way, right, that this, this uh, militarized training facility in Atlanta is being built on a protected forest, right? Where do you think these prisons that they're planning are going to be built in Vermont? Do you think it's gonna be the Macy's? Anybody? No, I don't think so. So we, all the considerations that we have for how much work Vermont has done to try and protect its healthy soils, to protect the watershed, to protect the forests, we really need to be walk, like reaching across, you know, different organizational lines on these issues. And with that, thanks everyone, and thank you so much to Michelle and the organizers for making this happen. I just want to ground us all in, really briefly, another aspect of the Cop City project, which is the land it's going to be built on. The um, Atlanta City Council and the mayor just approved leasing 381 acres of the Walani Forest to the Atlanta Police Foundation for $10 a year. I think like we all could come up with more than $10 and maybe put in a competing lease, but I don't think that's how that works. Um, and this is land that was stolen from the Muscogee people in the 1820s. For much of the 20th century, until as late as the 1990s, it was a forced labor farm where incarcerated people worked without getting compensated. It's land with so, so, so much trauma. And now it has recently become one of the most healing places in Atlanta that is at least absorbing some of the worst impacts of climate changing, climate change, mitigating flooding, keeping the stream flow clear in the creek that it drains into, providing some shade and cooler temperatures for the majority black neighborhoods nearby and they want to clear cut it all to make a cop training ground for the entire country. And this kind of thing is happening in Vermont as well, and that's just some of these linkages that Michelle was talking about I want to make. Like right across the street, I'll say a sentence, that's the largest private green space left in, Ver in Burlington. They're going to build a Nordic spa there. It's poison land. It's was one sacred land to the Abenaki. It used to be a highly productive marshland. They poisoned it, and now they want to build a spa on it. Um, in the Intervale, on an Abenaki archaeological site, is the McNeil plant, which burns forests from all across the state. And now, also, we have the Forest Service is proposing some of the largest logging projects ever in the state. Right now, the Telephone Gap project is up for debate. It would be almost 12,000 acres of some of the most mature forests in the state that they want to heavily log. Um, the comment period for that is four more days. So you can see Laura, who is walking around, handing out flyers in the black um, pants and jacket, raising her hand. You should talk to Laura if you want to leave a comment. There's already been over 600. We're building momentum for that. And again, these um, 
issues are all related. Destruction of forests, destruction of nature, and destruction of each other. So stop Top City and fill out a comment card. Thanks. <laughs> we're going to have Andy who's going to talk to us more about the, these conservation efforts. Hey, my name's Andy. I hadn't planned to say anything today, but we're standing in front of the Barge Canal. I've been working with a group called Friends of the Barge Canal, and it's not just going to be a bathhouse here. It's going to be a bowling alley over there. And the, the thing is that um, this barge canal, and I don't want to go into this very long, but this, this area right here is a sacrifice zone. It's been used as a sacrifice zone since 1849 for the prosperity of Burlington industry. There was lumber yards, there was a manufactured gas plant, this here was, you know, brush factory, there was upholsteries, there was General Dynamics and Bell Aircraft over there. They all dumped stuff in this area. And since 1966, when they closed the manufactured gas plant, it's rewilding by itself. And since 1992, when the people of Burlington rose up and said to the EPA, no, you can't take all of this soil and water and put it into a toxic waste dump over next to Lake Champlain, people actually organized and kept the EPA from doing that. And for the first time ever, the EPA had to shelve their plan for, quote, remediating this area. This is why when you look out there now, you see trees, you see beavers and deer and muskrat and herons. And it actually is, as Chris said, the biggest wild space in Burlington right now. So keep your ears open for e efforts that we're doing over the next uh, three months to organize around this Barge Canal, friendsofthebargecanal.com, I mean, by, dot org. And, um, uh, you know, uh, it, it is all connected. But uh, I couldn't avoid saying something since we're standing right here. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And uh, speaking of sacrifice zones, you know, one of the biggest sacrifice zones that I can think of is the entire working class, right? And, and it just continues to get worse and worse and worse as we're facing, abs and, you know, and I don't think this is my humble opinion, right? There's an entire international community of scientists that are telling us that we are facing ecological and climate disaster, right? As these corporations continue to try and extract every single, I almost swore. <laughs> He's here. <laughs> He's heard worse. <laughs> every single possible thing that they can out of the planet and the working class. And with that, related to dealer.com and literally related to Cox Enterprises, my favorite, absolute favorite class trader and uh, Fergie, would you like to come address the crowd? Hello. I haven't been to Burlington in 20 years. Um, the last time I came here, the Iraq war started the next day, and I got arrested on the New York side. Um, but I just moved to New Hampshire. Um, uh, I actually wanted to ask if we could uh, just have a moment to acknowledge uh, Manuel Tortuguita Paez Serán. Uh, which I probably butchered the pronunciation of, but the forest defender who was murdered by Atlanta police um, when things really recently escalated uh, for sitting in a tree. So if we could just have uh, not a whole minute, but just a little moment of silence uh, to remember uh, them first. who personally uh, lost two people to police violence since I got involved in opposing police violence. Um, so it, it, it gets really real when it gets really real. Um, but my name is James Cox Chambers, Jr. Um, everyone knows me as Fergie. Uh, 
I live in New Hampshire. I work as a journalist uh, and an organizer. Um, I'm uh, in a leadership position of a very small organization called the Berkshire Communists in Western Massachusetts. And I mostly manage our free martial arts and self-defense program and I'm part of our political education. Um, we're also developing a journal. But above all, my occupation in life is attempting to leverage the skills, connections, and resources that I was lucky to end up with towards furthering revolutionary consciousness in this region and this country and strategically allocating and redistributing the pile of generationally stolen wealth that I was born on top of. By Bluetooth origin, disconnected. <laughs> I am from the class of people who dominates and exploits the masses and who sets the rules and standards in our society in this country. And in an age of, in an age of advanced imperialism, or what Huey Newton would call reactionary intercommunalism, this really extends to the entire globe, right? We make the rules. I'm a member of the Cox family who, depending on who, where you look or who you ask, falls somewhere in the top 10 richest families in the United States. As a family, we have complete private ownership of Cox Enterprises Incorporated, which is headquartered in Atlanta, which includes one of the largest cable and internet, internet providers in the country, Mannheim Auto Auctions, Auto Trader, Kelly Blue Book, Dealer.com, uh, a large investment in Rivian, cloud technology for surveillance with the Department of Defense, and a slew of TV and radio stations and newspapers, including the only paper of note in Atlanta, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and the largest TV and radio stations in that city. Um, we also, similarly to this, swapped the old newspaper building to the city for free in exchange for tax breaks, and I believe they built a cyber crimes uh, surveillance research facility in that building. Um, we as a company uh, have hosted many events for the Atlanta Police Foundation, which is the organization behind this Cop City project. Um, excuse me. Which seeks to annihilate 90 acres of forest in southwest Atlanta, which is known as one of the city's four lungs, in order to build a police training ground five times the size of anything the NYPD has access to. My first cousin, Alex Taylor, who is the CEO of Cox, currently occupies an honorary chair position on the, on the police foundation. The extent of his actual involvement is unclear to me, but I know he and other high ups at Cox and other Atlanta corporations have access to regular updates and intel on the project uh, and have significant influence with every city and state office. My father, James Cox Chambers Sr., who doesn't work for Cox but is a primary owner, is also part of the State Farm Arena ownership group who own the Atlanta Hawks. They are also a major funder of the Atlanta Police Foundation. Let me back up one second. There's been a lot of chatter as usual about the diversity of tactics used by our comrades defending that forest down in Atlanta. And a lot of this shit we heard during Ferguson, George Floyd, about peaceful versus non-peaceful process, condemnation of quote violence, and predictably mainstream emphasis on love and civil society. Well, who made the rules in that civil society? Bluetooth, connected. <laughs> who benefits from those rules? I'm gonna go back to Huey one more time. And I'm quoting Huey Newton here, we condemn violence, but we make a distinction between the violence of the aggressor and the self-defense of the people. He goes on, the only way the people of the world can resolve the contradiction between love and defense is to reverse the dominance, at which point we can keep the love and get rid of the gun. In the end, the national movement against police violence and truly the international revolutionary struggle is all about this dynamic. The reality that the violence unleashed upon the people of the world by the dictatorship of capital which is centered in this country cannot be overcome by simply reforming our system and asking daddy nicely to give us more toys and more rights. Anyone who's had to face the violence of the state head on understands this. And that's why I ended up where I did in spite of my family. When I was young, Really, because of my family's resources, I was subjected to all forms of institutional violence, state, medical, police, etc. I grew up in the Northeast, but I moved to Atlanta in 2012 to work for my family's company for a year when I was like 20. Um, it was in southwest Atlanta next to the Walani Forest. Uh, the workers were mercilessly exploited there. Their hours were manipulated. There were mass layoffs during the recession, while my family profited in the billions. Uh, I left that after a year and I came back to Atlanta in 2012 and this is when my time in organizing really began, mostly centered around the issues of police terrorism. 
We worked through the spontaneous uprisings of Ferguson, Baltimore, Charlotte, Baton Rouge, Minneapolis, Charleston. We organized jail support and direct actions back in Atlanta. We opened a gym and meeting space which didn't allow cops or active military, and we caught some heat and death threats for it. Then I was at Standing Rock where we faced incredibly brutal state violence from federal, local, uh, all sorts of jurisdictions, and from G4S, the largest private security firm on earth, which has private prisons in Louisiana, which holds children in solitary confinement in occupied Palestine, and which does corporate security for a million corporations, including Cox. Um, and I came back north and started some projects up here. Uh, during the George Floyd uprising, I was arrested with 320 people in Mott Haven in the Bronx, and all of us were beaten. New York City just awarded each of us $21,000 in a settlement for what happened after that when they suspended our rights for more than 24 hours. Um, but it's not coming from the police pension fund, which I wanted to mention this. It should come from the New York City police pension fund and not from tax mayor money in New York. Um, I've been in war zones that were torn up by bombs from the US. So with this and a lot of training and education from revolutionaries, especially from the black radical tradition, um, this is how I came to orient myself as someone aiming for class traitorship and why I feel so strongly about this issue. Um, and these are, are my friends and comrades who are down there fighting this fight, a lot of them. So that my family's paper may claim that they're outside agitators that are doing this, and this is bullshit. Um, these are the people of Atlanta, of all varieties, saying no. Ah. Excuse me. To the furtherance of a violent police and surveillance state which has already displaced enough black Atlantans that the once black majority in the city is now gone that Martin Luther King's neighborhood is nothing but multi-use development, smoothie joints, surveillance cameras, and cops on scooters in riot gear, brought to you by the convergence of ruling class interests, AKA the Atlanta way, where policy is determined by back room deals, the real estate industry and the hedge funds who dominate it, uh, who sit on boards and work the investments of corporations like Cox and Norfolk Southern, who support the enlargement of the police state to protect their hoarded assets who destroy the communities and the ecosystems which have existed for generations. Um, and the people opposing these measures are the workers and the students and the clergy and the hustlers and the mothers and the down on their luck and everyone in that city who didn't get lucky enough to be born on top. And this is truly the American way across the board. And this is the last bit I'll go on before the importance of what, you know, uh, the, the, the calls to action that obviously my relationship to my family and the company has always been uneasy. But this complicity in Cop City and then the criminal nature of our media's coverage uh, of the whole episode, which at this point has cost one innocent life and threatens the well-being and freedom of dozens more, many of whom are now charged with domestic terrorism for going to a concert or sitting in a tree um, where the, uh, to the point where the bail fund that I used to help run uh, has seen hits that we never thought imaginable, like hundreds of thousands of dollars a person, um, you know, facing like really serious sentences for doing nothing. Once things got to this point, I made the final decision to do everything I could to divest from any association personally from my family's company. Legally, I can't discuss the aspects of this any further, but I encourage everyone who can do that in any capacity to do the same. So workers in any Cox companies whether it's right here at dealer.com in Burlington, Vermont, um, whether it's a guy I saw driving a, a Kelly Blue Book car on the way on 89 from New Hampshire, uh, down in Atlanta at the AJC, driving the cable vans in Phoenix, you can stage work slowdowns, sick outs or stoppages. Customers of any of Cox's businesses can take their business elsewhere and tell them why. And anyone can write to Alex Taylor, my cousin, the CEO, to James Cox Kennedy, the chairman, to my father, James Cox Chambers Sr., his sisters, Margaret F. Taylor and Kathy Rayner, or his cousin Blair. This is the generation of people who hold power in that company and could tell the mayor to stop this right now if they wanted to, um, and could certainly divest publicly, and could certainly make the media stop telling a bunch of lies about the people who are trying to save a forest. Um, uh, I publicly ask my family to disavow this Cop City project, and I urge anyone with any connection to any of the corporations involved to do the same. The cooperation of Cox's media with the mayor and the PD's agenda has been seamless, 
This is something no one ever voted for, and the rest of the media have followed suit. <clears throat> this has enabled them to maintain a ridiculous narrative, and especially to trump up these incredibly dangerous domestic terrorism charges. And what's the answer to this plague of police terrorism? I would say that we cannot reform a system which is doing the work it is intended to do. We know that this system will try to annihilate anything and anyone who meaningfully challenges it. That is why Tortuguita is dead. That is why Martin Luther King, Malcolm, and Huey are dead, why Asada Shakur flew to Cuba, but while Andy Young became an ambassador and John Lewis served in the Senate, approving every military budget he ever saw. Because they played ball with my family in Georgia. We don't need to fund stuff like this. Billions at cop training, billions at militarization, billions to send Ukrainians and Russians to be cannon fodder, and no resources to our communities. Food, schools, housing, simple shit. And yeah, we need community control over police, but we need community control over government, infrastructure, and the means and rules of production. So long as the police work for the rich, and this is a system dominated by the rich for profit, the police cannot be reformed to serve the people. And the prisons cannot be a place of healing and rehabilitation. The system right now must end, and the displays of resistance and power we've seen in places like Ferguson, Standing Rock, and Willani Forest show us that this is very possible, that there will always be more of us than there are of them. I encourage everyone to join a revolutionary organization today, to join a revolutionary study group, because if we are not organized, we can never convert these moments of spontaneous uprising into sustainable power. And if you have some means, because we all know that the Champagne left has a huge presence up in New England, throw that shit down on these bail funds, because it's unprecedented. Uh, ATLsolidarity.org on that sign. Uh, as much money as you can. Uh, I've donated a lot to various groups down there, community movement builders, other grassroots groups, the bail fund, especially after this de uh, domestic terrorism stuff. Um, and then the last thing. Uh, I did want to encourage people to attend the anti-war rally in DC that's coming up on March 18th. There are a lot of groups involved in that. Um, and to speak to someone from one of the groups who spoke today, uh, if you want to get involved. My message from the 1%, as always, is that we are paper tigers, that the masses make history, and that you should come and take what's yours from us. All power to our comrades in Atlanta, all power to the memory of Tortuguita, and much love to everyone here. Let's build a movement they can't stop. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Fergie. Kids. Um, what do I want to say here? A couple of things. One is, as you've you know seen just from the speaker lineup here, that there's a variety of different organizations who oftentimes you know get very focused on the particular issues that we are working on. Why? Because there's a lot of work, right? It takes a lot of effort. But sometimes that does tend to make us very siloed in the way that we organize and the other organizations that we work with. And I am just, you know, th this is my mantra <laughs> for 2023, is set the bullshit aside, right? We as a movement need to actually be a movement, right? We need to be using all of the tools in our toolbox a variety of tactics and a variety of skill sets. As a history of the left, oftentimes we, you know, shoo shoo on people who focus on policy work. And the people who focus on policy work, you know, shoo shoo on the people who are much more involved in direct action, right? And then everything in between. We have to be using a variety of tactics. We have to be showing up for each other. We have to be taking a very broad based approach to how we're seeing the interconnectivity of these issues and working together, right? We have to coalition build, we have to work together. I don't wanna hear anything about the People's Front of Judea or the Liberated Front of the People. Who knows that reference? Am I just fucking getting old? Okay, there's like four of us in here that know that reference, okay. 
So anyway, tough crowd. Um, <laughs> So with that, I just want to thank everybody again so much for coming up today and showing up. And I want you to be on the lookout and be prepared and to be prepared to move faster than sometimes that we often do, because especially in Vermont with our weather, and all the things and the distances that people have to travel to get anywhere to do anything and the types of roads that we're having to travel on, it can be tough, right? So we're often you know, planning long times in advance to do things but the urgency, we have to be able to meet the urgency of the moment. We're going to have to be flexible. We're going to have to be agile. We're going to have to be prepared to do that. Right? So just be on the lookout. There's going to be a couple of things that are coming up in, in April. Bree Her is going to be planning an event in Montpelier on the State House. So keep an eye out for that. Be prepared to be involved, required to do the things. Right? And, um, and, as, and I'm sure Stop <laughs> City is just going to continue, especially over the summer, to heat up, right? And one thing I know about Vermonters and how deep, you know, some of the folks here have skill sets, um, you know, I think that, you know, we need to be starting to organize in our affinity spaces and circles to possibly make a trip when the call is made to do a thing, right? There's some discussion that this could escalate to another standing rock. And uh, I know folks in Vermont have awesome skill sets to be able to do the things, mutual aid work. So I have a feeling we're going to have a strong contingency there. I like to make that a thing. So anyway, thank you all so much. We're going to head back the direction that we came. And we're going to go and have uh, dinner with the People's Kitchen. So awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.